the reading corner today, uh, something a little different. I'm really pleased to be welcoming Sam Langley Swain, who is the publisher um, with Outlet Press, the, the owner and publisher of Outlet Press, which is a relatively new children's book publisher. And also Monica Singh Gangotra, whose book Sunflower Sisters, illustrated by Michaela Diaz Hayes, was published by Outlet Press earlier this year. It's a great pleasure to be welcoming both of you to talk about these very important projects. Thank you so much for having us. You know, I think, Sam, perhaps we could start with you, uh, because I know that not only are you a publisher, but you're an author too. Um, and you published a book called, self-published a book called What Wesley Wore. I'm interested to know the story behind that and how it led into you setting up a publishing house. So my background traditionally isn't from books at all. I'm more of a pictures guy. I graduated with a fine art degree and worked in creative marketing for a number of years. My world changed when I adopted two children and became a parent overnight to two siblings. And I was in quite a demanding job at the time. And about two weeks in, actually, from when our children were placed with us, I had to fly to America for work. And I missed my children a lot. And my head was in a million different places. And almost to give myself some sort of comfort, I started writing just notes about a story, which ended up being what Wesley wore about a little character that was othered and felt different and actually resonated with me when I was a child. And strangely, I, I saved those notes on a memory stick and filed it very, very far away. Um, and I actually started out at Press off the back of a Christmas story, which I wrote, inspired by my children, which was called Santa's Wish. And it was to encourage people to be kind and help vulnerable families at Christmas. And then we sold 8,000 copies in the first 12 weeks, which was incredible, not without work, <laughs> because I was at every Christmas fair, every school fair, um, every market, and just peddled the book as hard as I could, which actually drove some revenue and an interest for me as an author. And people were asking me where the next book came from. So I then self-published a couple of other books and and what Wesley War was actually our first title with the Outlet Press logo on which was really fantastic um, and since then we've grown we've had some great industry advice and expertise and Wesley's actually sold into 13 territories all over the world which for me personally as an author is an incredible gift and something that is still very humbling and moving. It will be really evident to listeners that uh, the two books that you've talked about have a social conscience at their root and a kind of commitment to social justice, really. Mm. So I'm assuming there's something deliberate about that. I would say, yes, deliberate rather than accidental, but it was very instinctive. I felt that every book that I wrote was inspired by either a problem that my child faced or an issue that irked me as an adult or to you know feel like I was giving back or, or creating a book that would do good. We have become known as an inclusive indie, which is a badge I'm really proud to wear, but it was never intentional. It was always natural. I'm part of a two dad family. I have a diverse community of friends and we started publishing friends and family at the start. And it was naturally inclusive because that's the way that I live my life. But yeah, social justice and doing good is, is a key thread throughout the book. And some, like Sunflower Sisters and other titles like None and the Lonely Fisherman are very overt in that. And others are more playful at the surface, but actually do have an inclusive thread, you know, whether that be a window into an inclusive society or to teach children about acceptance and advocating others. There's always something that does good. And we will diversify in future because there are other things that Outlet Press cares about, such as the planet. Um, so we have got some books that touch on endangered wildlife and how we've got a responsibility there. And also the arts. Being an art graduate, I'm really passionate about how our arts are struggling and what books we can launch to encourage children to be visually creative and free and express themselves. So there are a few key themes that will build as the business grows. Fantastic. One, one question before we turn to Monica and hear a little bit more about Sunflower Sisters. Why Owlet Press? Oh, well, having worked in brand strategy previously, I, it is a custom for me to come up with logos and branding. 
but I actually had to come up with the branding really quickly to put it on a book before it went to print. Uh, and I actually had about half an hour to decide what the business was going to be called um, because I was trying to gain distribution. Like you say, it's so important. And at the time we were um, represented as a Langley Swain books and it just felt too self-centered, too vanity publishing, a bit too small and it needed a, a more universal name. So we made the decision very quickly to change. And I wanted to focus on, we've got a, a tagline at the moment, which is called growing into wisdom. So it's about, giving that wisdom to children through the stories. So we're thinking about the wise old owl um, and the baby owlet. So, um, and I couldn't believe that it wasn't already taken. It was like it was meant to be. There were domains, there were social handles. We built a logo really quickly out of some um, pre-existing illustrations. And yeah, the rest is history. It's a lovely story, great story. Thank you. Uh, Monica, lovely to turn to you and perhaps to hear something about your story. Before we get into the book itself, Sunflower Sisters, Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I was born in Canada, grew up in Australia, fell in love and got now I live in the UK. Um, so I have quite a diverse kind of background, very interesting upbringing in a small town uh, on the coast of Australia, a very sunshiny environment to grow up in, specifically with regards to the issue of colorism. That was quite an issue growing up because we, we were growing up under the Australian sun. And so that's what uh, Sunflower Sisters, how Sunflower Sisters was born. But in terms of myself, I uh, educationally, I have a background in psychology. I have a PhD and I'd like to think myself as a creative. I've always got my fingers in different kinds of pies because I feel that's a true expression of who I really am. Um, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to hopefully be doing some good while following a creative passion. So that's that's where my journey is now with Outlet Press. So psychologist, writer and fashion designer. Correct. Yes. My goodness me. So we're going to hear a bit about that because you're going to tell us a little bit about Sunflower Stories. It sounds listening to you now that this has got a strong autobiographical theme running through it. Yes, absolutely. Originally, the story Sunflower Sisters was written about birds um, because it was a children's book. I had to weigh up how uh, confrontational, how um, upfront or um, harsh, I guess, the story could be. Because I think when you're talking about real life isms, when you are actually depicting them as real life characters that look like you, talk like you, live like you, they can be quite confrontational. So the original story was actually about blue birds. Um, and one was the bluest bird, um, which had a slightly darker hue of blue feathers and when I submitted the manuscript it was my uh, publisher that turned around and said I love the story but write the real story people need to hear what really happened and, and they need to be it needs to be more real um, and that was the best advice I've ever been given about my writing write the real story yeah and so I went back and I I wrote it and I have to say it was very cathartic to be able to process these things and how real they are and be able to come up with kind of solutions of what I hoped it would be and what what it can be. So for listeners who might not have read the book, can we just give them a brief synopsis? Yeah. Um, Sunflower Sisters is an empowering and uplifting uh, picture book about two best friends, Amrita and Kiki, who learn about colorism on their journey uh, through a family, two family celebrations of weddings, um, each in their home, and how they learn the importance of loving the skin you're in, loving yourself, but also the importance of loving one another. I think we often come across a difficulty in being able to constantly love yourself. However, I do feel that there's a choice that can be made when we love someone else. And I think if we are that to one another and we create this beautiful symbiotic relationship where there's just kindness and love that's ever growing like a sunflower, I think that is something very, very beautiful. And uh, so that was the focus in the story about loving yourself and the importance of loving others and being one another sunflower. So you presented a manuscript to Sam, but of course it's a picture book, which is gloriously, I mean, the sunflowers just lift your spirits when you look at it. And you know, uh, the colour of the costumes and everything seems to reflect that Australian sunshine that you're talking about. Sam, you must have had a role in this in terms of matching up the story with 
the right illustrator. Yes, for sure. And sometimes this is my favourite part of the process and other times it's the most frustrating part when you can't find the artist that you need to match your vision. It was really important for us to have a team that worked on the book that could all relate to the subject matter and had lived experiences. So before we even selected our illustrator, we worked on the content with um, a black editor and an anti-racism activist and an anti-racism expert to explore how hard some of the imagery should be and how hard some of the text should be. And the main overriding message was that some of these things need to be in the book because they are signposting children to what this is. And it was a learning for me that you know children as young as picture book age if not younger are experiencing these extremities um but then reaffirming with positivity love empowerment and affirmation which i think the book does really well and monica talks about lovingly redirecting which i think is a a fantastic phrase for the book so that team then helped me find the right artist and then coincidentally there was an illustrator that i worked with before on a book called don't begin this book and I didn't realise that that illustrator had uh, lived experiences of colourism and actually was from black and brown communities. And it wasn't until I saw a post on their Instagram where they'd drawn a little black girl with a sign saying racism is an epidemic that I realised and saw a photo of her and I said, oh my gosh, why this this illustrator is under my nose? And it was Michaela Diaz-Hayes. And the more I got to know about Michaela, the more it was meant to be. So in the book, we have a South Asian family and a black family. And Michaela actually was married into an Indian family and is from black heritage. So it just made so much sense. She was able to relate so much into the imagery from her own upbringing and experiences, even down to the grandma wearing sliders, which any South Asian person will see and laugh and smile and be like, that's my granny right there. Mm -hmm. But for me, it washed over me as a white person. So it was great to have that, you know, instantly put in from choosing the right artist. It was really worth it. Monica, can I ask you, do you see colorism as part of racism? I think it draws from racism in that the closer we were to being fairer skinned, the more likelihood we were to find a a good partner in life, be successful, have opportunities, be seen as beautiful. It can be quite a very vain thing. And that's why the wedding situation, although joyful and wonderful and beautiful to illustrate in the story, there is an undertone that being seen as beautiful at a wedding would mean that you would have to have fairer skin and that you could only wear certain colours. So, yes, I do feel there is a stem of racism that comes through. However, the issue with colorism is that it's a real internal issue within one's race. Colorism stems from the fact that we are doing it to each other, which mm-hmm. I think is, is really devastating in itself in that we should know better, really. So this was about educating one another because it's hurtful and it's unkind and you're restricting opportunities for people that have so much to offer the world by just these views. Mm-hmm. And I think especially in the story where we talk about the grandmother's relationship with Amrita, you can see that she absolutely adores her, but these views are just so ingrained that by by mum stepping in and saying that that's not okay, um, it really shows grandma, actually my love is more important than than the colour of her skin and that she is beautiful. And, and in really, a way it's uh, an issue that sort of goes beyond the, the family and the personal when we step into, say, India and we see the sort of global cosmetic companies selling a dream, if you like, they liken it to tanning you know that that's how they justify those actions and that must be quite hard to to shift because we know what the beauty industry is like here and how difficult it is to shift ideas about body image for instance exactly I mean it's it's definitely on that level isn't it I think A really big issue growing up was that South Asian pop culture had a very heavy display of colorism. The word beauty became synonymous with the word fair skinned. So the word for fair skinned is gaudy. So where people would say, oh, you're very beautiful, they would say you're very gaudy. So anyone that had a darker skin in films, they were sorry, they weren't ever heroines. They were always uh, backup dancers. You would never see a fair skinned backup dancer because the fair skinned heroine was at the front. And we aspired to be that because they lived these glamorous lives and they have so much influence. And interestingly, like uh, makeup artists, South Asian makeup artists, they would only carry foundation up to a certain number. Anything beyond that would 
would be they would correct their skin to make them lighter and those products can actually be quite toxic um, so I, when I was doing some research, I was finding that there are lots of skin lighting products that are actually quite harmful, women dying from kidney issues, or organ failures and things like that because mm-hmm. of the toxicity levels. So, yeah, it is very, very devastating and the exposure ex- is extremely high. Um, and I can only speak from my lived experience as a South Asian. There is not one single South Asian person, I guarantee, would lay my life down that hasn't had some form of colorism in their life, whether they've been exposed, seen, witnessed, or a victim of. Um, it is all around us constantly from the day that you're born. I do want to move on to positive things because actually your story is an incredibly positive story. The girls have wonderful parents who actually are saying to the older generation, no, no, this isn't right now. So they've got that support and they, they go off and they set up their fashion industry. I'm guessing that's you there. (laughs) I worked as a stylist for a number of years and then I uh, felt that I wanted to make my own clothes. Um, And now I work with a wonderful artist who does all my print design and she's my business partner. So all the all the outfits that we create are all hand painted designs. Um, they wow. get printed onto fabrics and they are all completely one-off pieces. We don't do replicas. So every piece is like a, a heritage keepsake piece. Um, so we are very slow fashion, but uh, fashion that we hope that will be representative of who we are, which is a combination of influences and cultures. Sounds um, wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to go and do some searching after this and find out <laughs> even more. Um, An important thing now is obviously this book is out in the world and I'm interested to know about the reception from readers and whether you can see that this is having a positive impact. I definitely believe it does. We have been so lucky uh, so far, Sam, that Mm -hmm. we haven't had any negative feedback. But my two main pillars in the book are about uh, representation and education. So having the right accurate representation and also having correct information um, so the lived experience story is added as it is the phrase as that I said the way we spoke about skin color is accurate in my experience these are real things that were said to me and real things that I grew up in mm-hmm. education and representation were two very big things and as readers have read the book I think that's really helped all readers develop a level of empathy even if they haven't gone through it so it's like oh wow I didn't know this existed um, but now I do and I can recognize it so when I hear something like this I understand now that that's colorism but there's also at the page at the back that will help readers think okay I know that that's happened this is what I can do about it to make change because I know it's not a very good thing Um, so that was really really important and that has that feedback that has come through from readers that don't ex- haven't experienced colorism or haven't come across it has been so wonderful um, because I think that's a great way to make change. Mm-hmm. Um, creating empathy, I think it was super important to not uh, have phrases like "oh, I don't see color" or "that doesn't mm-hmm. exist in my world." I think it was very important to acknowledge that this does exist for people and to acknowledge their struggle and plight. Because by saying we are all one, I think we ignore the wonderful differences as well. Mm. And so I wanted it to be empowering that, yes, we are all different. And that is amazing. And uh, and it should be just love and kindness and that we should accept one another for who we are. And that has really come through uh, from, from readers, especially readers of my generation now that are mums. I have received so many messages where they've said, I wish I had a book like this growing up. Growing up, I had horrible experiences with colorism mm. and I relate so much or this happened to my me when I got married or my cousin or my sister or my mum was like this or my grandmother made me feel this way. I think it's a really soft entry point for people to say, actually, that happened to me. Is there the same issue for men as there is for women or not? Yes. Um, it is absolutely there. There is a skin cream in India, South Asian uh, skin cream called Fair and Lovely that is heavily promoted by male Bollywood actors for men. Right. Um, so, okay. Yeah. I'd only ever seen the, the, the adverts for, for females, so I wasn't sure about that. Well, I'm really glad that the book is having so much success. I'm going to ask Sam, really, what, what's next in store for Owlet Press? And mm. is Monica going to be writing any more for you? There is a sequel already in the mix, which is great. 
The one thing I would also just round off about sunflower sisters as well is actually beyond the colorism story, which is at the center of this mm. wonderful book, there is also an education for people outside the communities of what real life is like. It was really important for me as a publisher and a white person to make sure that we had an accurate representation of South Asian people today and to not have stereotypes or tropes in the books, which we often see. There are still a tiny, 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 tiny percent of South Asian people in children's books, despite the population balance, um, which is absolutely insane. Um, but also, you know, the fact that these children grow up to pursue a creative career is actually quite impactful in itself because the cultural expectation is to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. And those frameworks are very, very rigid and very tight. And I've, I've learned this from my growing relationship with Monica and my other South Asian friends. And it wasn't until I heard Monica speak on a South Asian women creators event that I actually thought, oh my gosh, yes, this actually is a complete shift in itself without all the colorism theme the fact that it's saying you can do what you want and be what you want to be and not be held back and be and you are empowered to do so in its own right is really important and i think that's resonated with the audiences and the readers and also we've just been so thankful to booksellers as well that have been open to be educated by this book um but the future is is bright for Alec press so um, I'm continuing to write, which is great. I have a book out in September called Storm in a Jar, which is about anger, which is inspired by the tribulations of my own children and the, the anger that they face in their situation. They're eight and 15 now. Oh, yeah. So well. um, they're a bit too old for picture books. But even so, my youngest talked about his own anger and, and used the metaphor of a storm in a jar. And I said, well, if you're not going to write anything about that, I'm going to put it in my ideas pocket and it will go into a book. And so I, I actually wrote Storm in a Jar after my great grandmother passed away. I wrote it on the day she passed away. And it links that anger to the loss of a little boy and his grandmother. And it's a really beautiful story. Um, and 2022 looks really exciting for us. Um, we've got a great lineup for the winter. But next year, we're focusing on um, a few stories that talk about mixed heritage. So the feeling of being othered. Uh, again, a very much younger book about being proud of brown skin. We've got books about blended families. And then we've got a few really fun animal-based books that are sending out the right message, you know, towards this social good as well. So I'm really excited that 2022 is nearly all sewn up as well. Mikaela and Monica are working together again on uh, Sunflower Sisters and the Jarman Tree. And I'll let Monica give you a, a 30 second synopsis of, uh, of what Jarman Tree is all about. Because it's if you thought Sunflower Sisters was good, you wait till you read the next one. Right. Oh, I, I can barely talk about Jarman Tree without crying. It is, again, it's a, it's a real life story about my, uh, my relationship with my grandmother. And it's about transgenerational love and the importance of nurturing, oh, I need a tissue, and the importance of nurturing our environment for future generations. And I am honoured to work with Makayla again. Um, in Sunflower Sisters, Makayla had done her research and kind of planted my uh, prints and things from my clothing label into the book. So Sunflower Sisters has become very personal and the story of it, the actual sunflower, um, which now is going to bleed into, um, into the German tree. Sounds wonderful. And I can tell that it's a story that's written from the heart. <laughs> So thank you both so much for joining me today. Sam, Monica, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. In the Reading Corner is presented by Nikki Gamble and produced by Alison Hughes. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please do leave a review for us. To find out about other projects, including an audience with events and the Exploring Children's Literature Summer School, visit www.exploringchildrensliterature.uk. Join us again soon in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform.